Well, I want to begin with a big thanks to Jeanette McDonald, um, whose name I just found out in this world is Jet. So, uh, Jeanette, thank you so much, and Capital University for inviting me here, and also um, to all of you who are, are gathered here. Um, I thought, you know, I was thinking about what, what would be uh, appropriate to speak about tonight, and in the light that I'm in a university setting where young people are moving across the threshold from an educational institution into the wider world. And what a crazy world. Um, you know, we have engendered. What a world we've kind of left for you to deal with. And I was thinking about uh, a wonderful writer named Barry Lopez, um, who has written many books that um, uh, deal with environmental and social concerns. And his work really uh, focuses on the experience of intimacy. When I say intimacy, I mean that kind of ultimate closeness, um, that sense of uh, not being separate, but of being really deeply connected one with the other. Um, Barry Lopez also uh, has a very uh, profound sensibility of the role of ethics in our lives today. You know, an ethics that is very much compassion-based. Uh, an ethic, if you will, that has um, some taproot that goes uh, right into um, the human heart, into human responsibility. And he wrote a wonderful book some years ago called Arctic Dreams. I have to say, I was a little bit cold today, and I thought, yes, I know it's spring, but I'm a little bit cold. And maybe this quote is uh, quite, quite appropriate for us. Because it, it is a way that we gather some of the threads that I think um, you and I and all of us in this room and really in the world need to address at this very unusual time we're in. We're in an extraordinary phase shift in um, uh, the world. And what Lopez wrote, he said, no culture has yet dissolved the dilemma each has faced with the growth of a conscious mind. I think that's what our education is about. It's not just about the acquisition of facts, but it's about some much a, a deeper level of how we awaken to truth. Lopez faced with the growth of a conscious mind, how to live a moral and compassionate existence when one is fully aware of the blood, the horror inherent in all life, when one finds darkness not only in one's own culture, but within oneself. If there is a stage at which an individual life becomes truly adult, it must be when one grasps the irony in its unfolding and accepts the responsibility for a life lived in the midst of such paradox. Hmm? There are simply no answers to some of the great pressing questions. You continue to live them out, making your life a worthy expression of leaning into the light. Wow. Wow. So we can ask, what do we mean by um, leaning into the light? And I, uh, the title of the talk is um, Altars in the Street, Compassion in Action. Hmm? Altars in the Street. So what do we mean by street? I mean, street is not just the street that I drove here on with Jet. Beautiful street with these wonderful houses. But street also refers to um, the sim simplicity of our everyday lives, you know, the street of brushing our teeth, 
but it also refers to the street of Auschwitz. It refers to the street of Libya. It refers to the street of uh, people who are dying. It refers to the street of um, violence against women as a weapon of war. So when we talk about altars in the street, we're talking about various uh, domains of various levels. And one of those levels has to do with a kind of the sort of intimate level of our lives. How do we, in our everyday lives, in the simple act of turning a light out as we leave a room, or maybe not flushing every, uh, after every use, how do we, in the intimate acts of our daily life, understand the interrelationship between those acts and what's happening in the Middle East, or what's happening in the aquifer, or what's happening in the atmosphere? It's really important for us to be, let's use the word, mindful of our interconnectedness with all beings and things. There's another level that we're talking about when we use the word street, and that is the level about which I was speaking, about the street where we find human suffering. And that suffering could be in our own heart, or it could be in a part of our neighborhood, or a part of the world where there's a lot of suffering. And I've made it a little bit my life um, to, as I'm leaning into the light, to at the same time face the darkness. Do, do you sort of get what I'm talking about? I mean, you know, sometimes we lean into the light, but we don't face suffering. But I think what makes us truly adult, I'm trying to get there at almost 70 years of age. It's been quite a climb. Somebody said, I was talking about a bumpy road today in this uh, uh, program I did over in the Lutheran Chapel. I was like, yeah, I really appreciate that bumpy road, but uh, usually not when I'm in, in the worst of its bumpiness. So I want to talk to you about a few streets I've been on um, this year. Uh, and this is, um, these are streets that are far away, but also very close up. And they are, I'm telling you about them because um, uh, I, I will say I've worked really hard in my life. Um, I have, uh, the, what can I say, the gift of having had parents who really valued um, conscientiousness, diligence, a duty, responsibility. They also value joy. And they brought into the, the heart of my life a sense of um, what it is about a path of service which is combined with the experience of joy. Not just, you know, sort of a heavy conscientious dutiness, which by the way, I read in the New York Times this morning. Um, People who are conscientious tend to live longer, so maybe there's a chance for some of us. <laughs> but in any case, um, I went uh, with uh, friends and clinicians, including, are you Pe Peggy's mother? No, you're not. Well, is Peggy, maybe she didn't make it here. Uh, you did, oh good, hi. So, uh, very nice to see you. Your daughter is wonderful. <coughs> Just absolutely wonderful. Now, Peggy is my assistant, and um, I actually feel a lot of compassion for her because uh, sometimes she has to keep up with somebody who's got quite a wind behind her. Anyway, Peggy and I and a group of clinicians and um, students went to Western Nepal in September to the poorest, most remote region of Nepal. And since 1980, I've been bringing clinicians to the Himalayan area from uh, Ladakh, Sikkim, uh, Bhutan, Nepal, and so forth, uh, as well as the Tibetan Plateau, in order to uh, provide healthcare services. And doing this more as a kitchen table operation. You know, I don't want to you know, cite gender here, but I'm not a person, I'm a person who started various institutions. 
but after you start enough of them, you don't want to start another. <laughs> and this is one of those things. I didn't want to build an institution around it. I wanted to serve, and I wanted to inspire. And so if the clinicians could catch that wind, then they had you know, plenty of data to work from. And we went to this place called Simico, in an area of Nepal called Hunlan, and went to a newly built hospital. It hadn't even been opened yet. And in the first day, um, hundreds of people showed up with uh, a huge range of ailments. And one old, older man, quite uh, very, very impoverished, quite dirty, walked in clutching uh, an armful of rags. And I was sitting uh, to the side of the main area of the clinic, and Peggy was doing triage with uh, Susan Bauer, who, a nurse, checking everybody who comes into the clinic, seeing which way they should be sent. And um, our people went over and realized there was something in the rags. And they unwrapped what was in the rags, and what was in the rags was a little girl who had been horribly burned. And as is you know, often the case in the way that people cook in this region, um, children often get burned because of the open fires. And in the burns um, were uh, maggots, which were kind of gross from one point of view. But another point of view, they were eating the infection. It was really, it was interesting. It was like, ugh, wow, that's kind of blessed, too. But it, you know, it was kind of intense. And I looked at both the mother and the father. The father was deaf, and the mother. And um, I looked into the face of the child, and then those of us, the clinicians and the health aid workers who were helping to uh, minister to the child. And that was altars of history to the max. I mean, it was so much compassion. There's so little aversion and a real absence of selfishness and a real presence of selflessness. And by the way, we had on that trip a group of uh, young people who were in their early 20s. And uh, one of those young people who went on that trip had been on three other trips I'd done like this and ended up going to medical school in order to bring this sensibility forward. So don't be, don't hesitate to um, step out of Columbus, Ohio, or step into a part of Columbus that is maybe not your neighborhood, because there you might find your vocation. But after that, um, about a month later, uh, we went to uh, India, and I was uh, to give a series of workshops in a hospice called Karuna Shraya, the place of compassion, in um, this very big town in India, a city in India called Bangalore. And uh, so we were brought late at night to the hospice and stayed in the hospice. And in the morning, with the medical director, we did rounds. And I was standing by the bedside of an older woman who was actively dying. Respiration rate was really high. And um, her son was sitting next to her. And he looked up at me with the most uh, sorrow-filled and um, uh, what was the other expression? It was a, 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 an expression of absolute bewilderment. And when he looked at me, some lines from the great uh, Indian epic, the Mahabharata, came up for me. And um, they are, uh, Yudhisthira was asked, what is the most wondrous thing in the world? And Yudhisthira replied, the most wondrous thing in the world is that all around us, People can be dying, and we don't realize it can happen to us. 
And those lines just went across my, you know, awareness like a banner on CNN. And I felt just this very deep connection with the young man. And I looked up and standing behind him were health aides, were young women from the poorest villages around Bangalore. Very uh, beautiful young women who had very little prospect in their lives. And they had come into the hospice to work as healthcare providers, as you know, hospice workers, to gain the experience and to be certified so they could go out in the world and have better jobs. And I looked right into the face of one of these young women and she knew clearly what the young man who was beside his mother did not know. It was a face whose eyes have such immense depth and also immense, uh, immense equanimity. Altars in the street. One more story. <laughs> And by the way, I'm very um, aware that my carbon footprint, uh, I better make up for it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, because this is yet again another trip. I'm standing in, um, on a bamboo deck uh, in February of this year. Peggy was not with me on that trip. But I'm standing on a bamboo deck uh, in February in northern Thailand, in a field of soybeans, field soybean plants. And I'm there to teach people about compassionate care of the dying. There are some villages in Thailand where 90% of those villagers have HIV. And what I was to discover very shortly into um, my uh, teaching experience, which tends to be more interaction, um, was that most of the women who were uh, in this program, and it's primarily women, middle age, they seemed like middle aged women, um, most of them were HIV positive. And all of those women got the AIDS virus from their husbands, saw their husbands through illness, took care of their children and their families in this journey of dying, buried their husbands, and decided to become AIDS activists and were village leaders. And I have to tell you, I was on my knees. It was incredible. It was so, such a privilege. Um, to work and learn from these women. To work with and learn from these women. And that is altars in the street. It was not only the street that I was standing on, but as well it was the street that they had chosen to walk down in turning their difficulties toward the world of suffering in their own communities. There's a quote from um, Rachel Naomi Remen that I often share with people because I think that sometimes our idea of compassion is a little bit um, distorted. And uh, Rachel Remen is a, a remarkable physician um, who has Crohn's disease, which is a, a really serious ailment. She's a very inspired clinician and teacher working primarily with physicians who want to re-inspire their work. And these are her words. She says, helping, fixing, and serving represent three different ways of seeing life. When you help, you see life as weak. When you fix, you see life as broken. And when you serve, you see life as whole. This is the spirit that I feel that these uh, women really exemplify for me. 
these women in Thailand. Even with the illness or really because of uh, their diagnosis and because of their intimacy with death, also being in a relatively blameless state of mind and heart, you know, it wasn't as though I was dealing with people who were rancorous toward their husbands who had made them ill or had, you know, they had, they served. They served. And that sense of service for me personally was uh, uh, exemplified in part by something that happened to me when I was very, very young. Um, when I was uh, four, I woke up with a viral infection and lost my eyesight for two years. And during that period, and I was also paralyzed on my left side. And so I was bedridden and my mother and father hired a really extraordinary woman, Afro-American woman, to take care of me. And it was during this time that, um, uh, when I was so ill, that I discovered um, that, one, I had an interior life. Do you know? I think that's what happened for uh, these women in Thailand. It certainly was true for me when I was very young because of the nature of my uh, illness. But I also learned that the woman who take, was taking care of me, her mother had been a slave. Shows you just how old I am. So you can, you can imagine, um, you know, I'm very young, I could barely grok what it meant. What is it to be a slave? But she was a slave, a chattel. And in a way, the woman who was taking care of me was a little bit that herself in my parents' eyes. But in my eyes, she exemplified two fundamental qualities, which I think are in the sort of middle of our most human experience. One of those qualities is freedom. I think we educate ourselves to become free, free of our ignorance, and free to choose the life that will really serve the world, our nation, our community, our family, ourselves. Freedom. Freedom is so important. We don't just educate ourselves to get a job. We really educate ourselves to be free. And the other quality is the quality about which I'm addressing tonight is that quality of compassion, which I think is not well understood in our culture but I hope to unpack a little bit more. It was really through my relationship with um, Lilla, who was my caregiver, that compassion uh, beca became a, a guiding principle of my life. I won't say I'm compassionate, because there are times when I lack self-compassion and compassion for others. But it is right on my radar all of the time. It is where I'm constantly learning about my own limitations, which I hope to see with compassion. And it was in part because of this that I became a Buddhist. As, um, as you heard, uh, you know, I'm a Buddhist who has been ordained in three different schools of Zen Buddhism. But I was born and raised in a Christian family, so I feel I also have deep Christian roots. And I often teach with uh, Christians, monks and nuns, and teach in Christian institutions. So don't let my Buddhism put you off. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I look on it more as a philosophy and a psychology, and not so much um, as uh, the kind of religion in, in that is, you know, very much a part of uh, my upbringing. But in this um, experience of uh, being a young person during the 1960s, where a lot of awakening was happening, it was kind of a crazy time. I see there were some others of you who were, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right around during the 1960s. And like many people, I was very, at that time, I was very polarized. And um, I heard a, a talk by Alan Watts, I read some D.T. Suzuki, and I said, wow, it's so practical. 
And you know, I'm a very pragmatic person. It really made sense to me. And then I read a line uh, attributed to the Buddha, which goes, I teach one thing and one thing only, the truth of suffering and freedom from suffering. The truth of suffering and the freedom from suffering. And so as a young person in the 60s, it was a time I looked out into the world, having been through quite a bit of suffering in my own short life, and I realized that the line resonated with me. I felt that I not only needed to lean into my freedom from suffering, but also to continue um, what had opened up for me as a young person, which is to be with the truth of suffering and to work with it actively in generating compassion. So we ask, how can um, we end suffering? And you know, part of it is waking up and really seeing reality, you know, seeing the truth of things as they are. But for many years, I have felt that literally the path of compassion of compassion in action, of service, the joy on the path of service. Service is practice, is the way that we not only awaken, but we help others be free of suffering. And I think that that's something that um, really cuts across all religions and all spiritualities. I want to be mindful of time, so. Because I want to leave a little time for questions, so forgive me for looking at my watch. I've given myself 15 more minutes, and then you're on. So one of the um, uh, people I very much admire in the world of Buddhism is a man called Alan Sunoki, um, who is uh, well known in the world of what's called engaged Buddhism. That is a Buddhism that's not just about religion and not just about meditation, but it's about applying your ethics, your values, and your vision of relieving suffering in a practical way in the world. And he came to Upaya, uh, the place where I live and work, uh, a couple of years ago. I'm so happy he's coming back. And he said some lines that really meant a lot to me, because I realized, in a way, I'd been um, guided by exactly those sensibilities. Um, he says, how do we address the issue of suffering in the world? And Alan said these lines. He said, I will listen. I will listen. How do we address the suffering in the world? It's not to immediately jump in and start saving, fixing. But the first thing that I will do is really, I will listen. And part of that listening is that capacity to really be opening to having suffering, suffering penetrate us. I will listen. Then Alan said, um, I will look you in the eye. So I was in New York on Sunday uh, doing a day-long uh, program there. And um, after the program, I had you know, kind of a lot of energy running, and uh, I wanted just to kind of walk in the streets. And it was in uh, the early evening. The light was just about out of the sky. The city lights were up. I'm walking down the street. I have my little down uh, jacket on. It was really windy. And I realized right in front of me was a homeless person. And I stopped. His hand went out. And before I put something in his hand, I will look you in the eye. I will listen. And I will look you in the eye. That human-to-human -human contact, the same kind of contact that I experienced with a young man in Bangalore. 
and a little girl in Humla, and the women in Thailand. I will look you in the eye. That kind of um, openness at a sort of person-to-person -person level to really encounter another's full humanity, including the truth of their suffering, the truth of their situation. And then Alan's fourth line goes, um, even though it's really hard, and let me say, uh, serving in the world where there's a lot of visible suffering, and we're not speaking about the suffering that's more invisible that we see in corporations and businesses and educational institutions, but where there's highly visible suffering even though it's really hard, and I don't know what to do. These are two very important dimensions. The thing that you think is the right thing to do for the dying person could be not the right thing at all. I really don't know what to do. Even though it's really hard, and I don't know what to do, I will not turn it away. I will not turn away. I will not abandon you. It really takes immense strength to stay. And then the fourth line that Alan shared with us was, I will walk side by side with you at your pace. I will walk side by side with you at your pace. It's not as if I've got the right pace or I've got the program, but I'm going to come right alongside, just as one ship does to another at your pace. A monk asked a very great Zen master a thousand years ago, what is the essence of your practice? And that teacher said to the monk, whatever is needed, whatever is needed. You know, it's in that spirit. And in that regard, I'm reminded of something I heard His Holiness the Dalai Lama say. Because His Holiness the Dalai Lama is a great, kind of a, a global person at this time in his life. Really a wonderful person. And he, his wisdom is also very practical. And he said, um, love and compassion are necessities. They are not luxuries. No, it goes, love and compassion are not luxuries. They are necessities for humanity to survive. Love and compassion are not luxuries. They are necessities for humanity to survive. So in our conference today, our small meeting, um, I met a wonderful anthropologist who was um, speaking about doing you know, an ethnography of this kind of world. And um, we both came to a very similar conclusion, that there are some things that can be measured. And there are some things which cannot be measured. And love cannot be measured. Love cannot be banked. In fact, it's true, the more you give away, the better off you are. The same with compassion. These are, in the Buddhist terms, the Brahma Viharas, known as the immeasurable states of mind. Love and compassion. So what do we mean when we use this word of compassion? And let me just do a little parenthesis here. Um, I uh, have been involved in the world of neuroscience as a contemplative and as a social scientist for many decades. 
I feel very fortunate to have uh, attended and participated in many neuroscience meetings around issues related to the study of compassion, of attention, and other mental states associated with meditation in an effort to actually sort of quantify uh, compassion. What are the features which social psychologists endeavor to do? And it's, it's kind of fun for me because we have a, a really extraordinary training at uh, Dupaya where um, clinicians from all over the country come. Now there's much more neuroscience because we realize that you know, medicine is very evidence-based, of course, and that clinicians want to be sure that this stuff works, that we're teaching them. It's just not you know, some kind of woo-woo stuff. So this is a field that has grown uh, exponentially in the past uh, two decades. And part of it is uh, social psychology, looking at some of the elements in these mental processes that um, uh, come together to, that make up, you know, a blip of the human experience. So I want to just unpack compassion a little bit, because this is about compassion and action. And, but it has some components that I think are important for you and I to, to know about. And the first is that uh, in order to be compassionate, um, we have to have the ability, the actual ability, to have an attention that is able to stay on one being for more than an MTV moment. <laughs> right? I mean, if we're just jumping from thing to thing, if we're in a kind of AD, ADHD situation, and, you know, we're priming ourselves all the time in how we are relating to our technology. And by the way, you know, I have a Facebook page, uh, you know, I'm on Twitter, I'm very much into the computer, but I also recognize I need an antidote to Googling, <laughs> to stimulating what is called um, the seek and reward circuits of the brain. Um, it's stimulating the sort of addiction to dopamine that our world has right now that I have to step away and be more relational. I have to step away and be more uh, attentive to my own physical and life and my own psycho-spiritual life. So how do we develop an attention that is able to stay on a phenomenon for more than a micro moment? Do you know what I mean? You just look at most of your behaviors on the computer, right? We're just like sort of um, panning gold. We're moving through much content at an incredibly high rate of speed, looking for something, and having that momentary sort of dopamine move, and then on to the next thing. It's just like if you're a guy chasing beautiful women, or if you're looking for a job, or whatever. Wow. <laughs> but how do we develop a quality of attention that is really grounded, that can endure for more than a micro moment, that is characterized by stability, and that is also characterized by vividity or high resolution, just like focusing a camera. How can we bring our attention to an individual who's suffering in a way where the attention is not clouded by our conceptual content of, of the mind? by our ideas of what we have to do to work with this person. But have a quality of attention that's very stable and present and where we really allow ourselves to be penetrated by the truth of this one's suffering. Now, I think our grandparents were better at this. Do, do you know what I'm saying? I think those of us who are you know, in this generation and I would include myself, you know, some of us are transgenerational, <laughs> but I hang out with a lot of young people, and um, it's a trip. I mean, the capacity to really bring your attention to a single object and keep it there without boredom and impatience arising is not easy. And without us being able to do that, compassion is not possible.
So it's going to take some training. The second thing is, in addition to attentional balance, is our capacity to actually be emotionally balanced. That is to develop intentionally pro-social mental qualities, mental qualities which are wholesome, which are really healthy, and not to be so upregulated that we're kind of in a state of extreme reactivity all the time. Say, so, you know, and I have to say, because I was young once, it's easier when you get older often. But if you have habits of hyperreactivity, they go right into your old age and death. So, so don't let it be an age-dependent thing. So emotional balance is really critical. And it's really critical for us, uh, or for those of you who are younger in this audience, to develop those capacities very early on because if you're in your late teens and early 20s, your prefrontal cortex, where your positive emotions and your less positive ones also, some of them, they're right there, you know, in the prefrontal cortex. That prefrontal cortex is still in development. And you want to take advantage of getting the right program into your nervous system when you're young, because it's really hard to untangle that tangle when you get older. Once those neural pathways kind of get set, you know, you, gotta, you have to work a little harder to reprogram yourself. It's called neuroplasticity. But get the right content in there. Get the right neural pathways stimulated. So this educational system that it has programs related to service and compassion, it's really important. You're not just sitting in a wonderful little bubble of Capital University in Columbus, Ohio. But you're, you know, you're, opening your arms to the wider community. So emotional balance is really critical. Another area of criticality is the cognitive dimension. And that relates to your intention. Compassion is an experience where you not only recognize suffering, and you not only feel the suffering of others. So you get upregulated. There's an aroused state. It's accompanied by some cognitive content, which is really essential. And one of those pieces is that you have this deep desire to help this individual or this situation have its suffering transformed. So that's intention. And the second is insight. If you're smart enough, you have enough insight to recognize that that person's suffering, I'm really attuned to their suffering, but I'm also not that person. You're able to distinguish self from other. And you know, this is the part I'm not good at. I think I've got all the other things pretty good. You know, I'm pretty good with attentional balance. I'm pretty good with emotional balance. I think my intention is really good. But um, I, you know, my, my thermometers, I go to the wrong kind of a movie, and I'm like, oh. Or I'm, you know, I read, I uh, was telling uh, uh, Jet, I was reading a book by Abraham Bergese called Cutting for Stone. Anybody here read that? Isn't it beautiful? I'm in the Los Angeles airport with tears streaming down my cheeks, you know, as I'm reading the last page, and I'm so identified with some of the characters in the book, I, I really got myself a little bit empathically over-aroused. So, <laughs> so that distinction between self and other is really quite important. And then there's the issue of how do I actualize it? You know, compassion in action. Can I do something that's useful? What is the thing here that will serve? Can I walk alongside this person at their pace, even though it's hard and I might want to turn away? Can I keep steady with this? Which brings us to the last feature of compassion. And that, this is one that's really puzzling, but it has to do with a particular circuit in the brain that I was speaking about earlier, the reward circuit. And that is um, usually when we're uh, studying, we want a good outcome. 
we want to get an A, or we want to graduate so we can get a good job. But since 1970, I've worked with dying people. And then I did six years of work inside the prison system at the penitentiary of New Mexico on death row and maximum security with guys, all of whom had murdered people. It was really powerful work. And this last feature that I'm going to tell you about is the most subtle and difficult to realize. But I really learned it by working with these two groups of individuals um, who were suffering. And that is, um, if I, when working with a dying person, the woman who um, had breast cancer um, was in the experience of active dying and insisted and got another horrendous intervention in order from her perspective in an attempt to extend her life, which really impaired the quality of her final days. And I knew it was not the right thing to do, but nothing was going to stop her because she was the mother of two young children. She's going to fight till the end, bring all medical science to bear on her situation. Her clinicians couldn't work her out of it. I couldn't work her out of it. Our team couldn't. I wasn't, you know, happy with it, that. But I realized that I couldn't be attached to the outcome. And that is the final feature. As I'm sitting with the man on death row, he's in his cell. He won't come out. I'm sitting on the concrete outside of the cell. The Food court is open, and he's called off his lawyers that they're in the final appeal process, and he'll be the first man to be executed in the state of New Mexico in 40 years. And the team from Texas is shortly arriving. And he was executed. It was not an outcome that I wanted. But I realized that my practice is always to return to not being attached to outcome. That is one of the most essential features of compassion. Yeah. So this is what we mean when we're talking about um, altars in the street. And I want to finish up my talk with some questions. Um, I don't understand, really, why educational institutions um, don't actively nourish the seeds of compassion within their students. I just don't, I don't understand it because what we've learned from the neuroscience work and from the work on the endocrine system is that compassion is actually good for you. It enhances immune responsiveness. It enhances neural integration. There are many other features uh, which compassion uh, uh, are, uh, enhance. I want to ask why we don't train our healthcare providers, our nurses, our doctors. Why don't we actively train them in compassion? If our work as healthcare providers, whether we're a doctor or nurse or whether we're a social worker, a counselor, psychologist, hospital, why don't we train people in compassion if our work is about alleviating suffering? And the final question is, I don't know why we don't vote for our politicians based on compassion. I just, it's, it's in a way, it's beyond me. We want a world that's more caring. We want our leaders to be compassionate leaders. And I feel we as global citizens, we're not just, um, you know, citizens of Ohio or New Mexico. Um, we're, it's a global world we're living in. We're global citizens. And it's really important for us to have a strong back and soft front, to have equanimity and compassion. So I recently, uh, I just want to finish up one little thing and then just 
said. <clears throat> um, you who are younger have an extraordinary assignment before you. I mean, it's uh, one of those things that I wish that I were 50 years younger. Um, because the world that is opening up at this time is a world that is full of paradox. It's full of tremendous knowledge and information, and there are many wise people in the world. It's a world that is also characterized by phenomenal advances in technology, but also it's just a devastating destruction of the natural world. We're seeing extinction of cultures, extinction of languages, extinction of species at a rate that is unparalleled, except for you know the time when the world of dinosaurs ended. But we weren't there then, Mr. Pankett. We really have a moment where we're being called to wake up. We have tremendous uh, responsibilities in the, this, these uh, days, weeks, months, years ahead of us. We mustn't turn away from them. You as young people just don't dissolve your life into making money, which is wonderful if you do give away as much as you can. But really give your life to the world in a way that when you're approaching your death, should you be young or old, you can approach it with a sense of I lived a good life. I helped many in the course of my life. I did my best to end suffering. I did my best to serve the world. And it's a high wall. It's not a low wall. It's so funny. I saw a funny little video of a, an orangutan, a hound dog hanging out. Anybody see that video? It's God, if that owl dog and the orangutan get, get along so well, how come we can? Huh? But at one point in the, this little funny video, it's viralized now, it's all over, you know, place. The orangutan, uh, hanging out with the dog, they just sort of went over this wall. And I thought, I wish our walls were as easy as that to go over. And I, I read this little bit at a conference I was at in Dallas uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, that uh, Robert Wicks um, quoted at the end of his book on the Brazilian tradition. And it's from Frank O'Hara, the Irish author. And he says, you know, as a boy, he and his friends would make their way across countryside. When they came to an orchard wall that seemed too high, too doubtful to try, and too difficult to permit their voyage to continue, they would take off their hats and toss them over the wall. Then they had no choice but to fall. <laughs> so um, I encourage us to take our hats off. It's a high wall, but we can do it. And thank you again, Jet and Capital, and I'm happy to take some questions and then let's meet outside. Thank you. Two questions. Does anybody have one? Stand up. Yes. What happened to the little baby who was born in Nepal? Well, it was amazing. So, um, you know, her wounds got debrided, they got dressed, the hospital put, put her up, and she's fine. It was, it was heavy. You know, you hate to see kids hurt like that. That's, you know, we old people, I think we can take a lot more. But you see these beautiful, innocent kids in these remote areas, and you just, you thank gosh for modern medicine in those times. Thank you. And one more question. Yes, speak loud. First of all, I want to thank you for sharing your story with us, really empowering, and sharing your story with us. And I'm just wondering, how do you hope 
Mm. I cultivate hope every day. And it is um, not a small thing. It's a big thing. It's a sense of um, tuning in to my, if you will, my own ground of being. And I know how, um, as I've matured, gotten a little bit more adult, I see more of my breadth and depth. And it was there the whole time. And so part of my work is to help others see their own breadth and depth. Because, you know, when you have a taste of your own, you can turn out into the world and you see despair, you see hopelessness, you see skepticism and anguish. You can really relate because you've had big tastes of that in your life. But at the same time, you've tasted something deeper. And that has, I don't know what you would call it, kind of that soul thing. You've tasted who you really are. And you know that's in everyone. And that's how I nourish my own sense um, of hope in the world. You know, it's a joy to come to a place like this, uh, where there are so many young people who are on the path. And um, my own Zen Center, it's the same thing. There are just some incredible young people in that environment who are really remarkable. And then I go to these countries, you know, that are really different from the West. And I meet these people, and they have it too. They have it too. But I have to tell you one thing. I went to Davos. I was invited to the World Economic Forum as a global religious leader. Now I'm in Washington, D.C., as a distinguished visiting scholar at the Library of Congress. And um, it takes a little bit more energy for me to sustain my hope in those kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs>